Good morning, everybody. My name is Alicia Moran, and I'm the manager of small business development. We're ready here to start in just a few minutes, but we're letting folks in. So please uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you want to, just to say hello. And then we're going to get started in a few minutes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. You, you're joining us for our Global Entrepreneurship Week program here in Prince George's County with the Economic Development Corporation and the Innovation Station Business Incubator. We're going to get started in just a moment. We're just letting folks in. If anybody wants to say hello, I just wanted to remind folks that you can say hello in the chat and just remind you that we are recording this session. So please be aware of that. And uh, and we'll have questions after each of the speakers. So just know we'll have a series of speakers coming up and then you'll have a moment to ask a few questions after. Um, and you can also uh, interact with people privately in the chat if you need to. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started in just about a minute here. Uh, I think we may still be letting folks in. So if you want to say good morning in the chat, please feel free to um, let us know that you're here. And uh, just know we will be having this session recorded. So just be aware of that. Thank you. Good morning, Darlene from BSU and Marcel Benson. Thank you for being here. Good morning, Jay Smith. Welcome. Good morning. All right, everybody. Well, I think we should um, maybe go ahead and uh, get started here since we've let folks in and um, everybody just had a minute to, to say hello in the chat if they wanted to. We do wanna try and make this a, a session where people can network. I know that we had um, at least 35 to 40 folks um, pre-registered and I'm sure there are others coming in. So we hope that more will be joining us in a moment. Um,
So just a, a few housekeeping things, just a reminder that we do have um, being recorded and that you are, please do, you know, say a note of welcome to others in, in the chat so people know that you're here um, and um, we're gonna get started here. So my name is Alicia Moran and I'm the manager of small business development here at Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation. And we are here celebrating local Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, global Entrepreneurship Week is actually an international effort and we have approximately 150 uh, countries participating in Global Entrepreneurship Week and 10 million individuals. So this session today, our local partners include those listed on the slide here. And we're very um, appreciative of all the local partners. This is a collaborative effort and we have a multitude of programs happening throughout the week here. And so you can look at our website, pgcedc.com to see the latest listing of all the sessions that are going on. Next slide. So our presenters today, we're really pleased to have a host of dynamic presenters and I can't thank everybody enough. You're gonna hear from TEGCO, the Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership, Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses, the University System of Maryland's Momentum Fund, the Dingman Angels and the Maryland Industrial Partnership. So we are looking forward to hearing from everybody today. Next slide. So for some of you, you may be joining us from afar, just wanted to make sure that you knew that Prince George's County is a dynamic county with 27 local municipalities and we um, are right up against the border of Washington, DC. We have a dynamic um, county and we are one of the top four. Um, our medium household income is one of the top four of all US counties. Next slide. So what's going on? We've been doing a lot. There have been a number of COVID related um, efforts, including a daycare center program that is open now, grant program and a restaurant relief program also open now. We also have had um, a business relief program that has been open and has been um, assisted about close to 600 companies with $20 million worth of funds. Part of that also was to create an Emerge Strong uh, program that actually provided CEO boot camps and a host of other sessions, including mentoring and counseling. We have a Buy Prince George's campaign to uh, support our local businesses. We are supporting our local Hispanic businesses and doing Spanish business language programs. And we have a Takeout Tuesday session to, to highlight our local restaurants. Next slide. We also have um, a series of programs with Innovation Station, with our Lurch Early Brewer legal programs, and we have a first Friday coaching session. I just wanna also make sure that everybody's aware that the Maryland um, University of Maryland's Smith School of Business has done a Maryland Business Reboot Program that is open to all Maryland residents and others. We also have Global Entrepreneurship Week, and that is happening now, so join us. Next. The business development team at Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation covers a lot of different areas, um, including technology and others. So joining us today, we have Martin Azima from our international team. Martin. Good morning, <clears throat> good afternoon, wherever you are, we are excited to have you today. This global entrepreneurship in 2020, you can imagine we want you to understand that uh, we're here to support you. We're here to do business. There's absolutely no doubt that the world is gonna come out of this. But first of all, I want you to just think and accept that this is gonna be the new normal. New normal meaning virtually meeting, doing business virtually, connecting virtually. We at Prejudice County are keenly aware of that. As you can see, uh, the county is well equipped. We have foreign trade zone. We are one of the best, strongest economies in the area. We have very, very strong export uh, relationship with uh, our global partners. So we are looking forward to trading with you. Feel excited, feel comfortable. If you haven't started exporting, give me a call, send me an email. If you're looking to bring foreign direct investment into this county, please feel free, reach out to us. We are open for business. Thank you and enjoy the program. So Martin is just one of the many team members here. And again, we have for lots of assistance in exporting and importing 
Um, we are a foreign trade zone, as Martin has mentioned. And so we also have a Hispanic liaison that is part of our team. And so we are pleased to, um, to offer a great deal of services for our international businesses, as well as our local businesses who wanna go international. The next slide, we're gonna talk about our small business services. And so just so you're aware, the Economic Development Agency can help with site selection and permitting and other things along those lines. We provide access to capital, connections to capital, educational workshops and programming. And we also provide access to coaches, counselors, and mentors. So we have a, a host of resource partners and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. Next slide. So our small business resources partners, these are them and many of them are gonna be speaking today um, and speaking again throughout the week of Global Entrepreneurship Week. So you're gonna be hearing um, today from TEDCO, but on Thursday, we'll be doing a session with the library and the University of Maryland Global Campus will be um, speaking in one of the sessions later this week. We also have Bowie State University and the Bowie Entrepreneurship Center on campus and the, and the Bowie BIC. So again, all of our business incubators and others in this research chart are often participating in these sessions. So just know there are lots of resources for small businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators here in Prince George's County and throughout the state of Maryland. Next slide. So Innovation Station, you're seeing it behind me here. We're not there, but we are coming to you virtually um, from Innovation Station. It is our collaborative co-working space and business incubator that helps to support existing companies and support our economic development mission of job creation, business retention, business expansion, and attraction. So we thank you for being here. And I'm gonna show you our contact information for Martin and I are on the next slide. And then we're gonna open it up to our first speaker, unless anybody has any questions right now. Are there any questions? If you have any questions, just please put it in the chat. Seeing no questions, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, and our first speaker is Steve Alvo from TEDCO and we're pleased to have him here. Steve, take it away. Great, thank, thank you, Alicia. And thank you, Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation for inviting me to speak today. So I'm gonna give a, a brief overview of TEDCO and, and our program. So if we can, uh, but, but let me start sort of with our mission. So if I can get the next slide. So TEDCO was created about 21 years ago, 21, 22 years ago. And we were really created to, as an economic development organization to focus on leveraging the federal labs and universities in our region to try to, try to uh, get more economic impact by transferring technologies out of those labs into the commercial sector. We've evolved over the years to supporting many early stage uh, companies uh, across the state of Maryland. But we're, we, when you look at our, our mission statement, we're, we're focused on ec economic empowerment. And that's a little bit different than used to be economic development. And we sort of see economic empowerment as focusing on the people rather than economic development where you're focusing on the companies. So, if we empower entrepreneurs to be successful, that will create jobs ultimately. But that's, a, that's sort of a, a, new, a new change that we have at TEDCO is empowering those in our ecosystem to be successful with creating companies. But we're also very focused on uh, being an inclusive innovation ecosystem. So we, we focus on the ecosystem and also the companies, creating the companies within that ecosystem. And I, I equate it a lot of times to, you know, we're, we're busy planting trees in terms of starting companies that will ultimately create jobs. But we need to make sure that the forest is healthy to make sure those trees can grow and be successful. So uh, for, that's the reason that we focus on the ecosystem as well. And tied very closely to our mission are our core values, right? And, you know, it's things like integrity and accountability and stewardship and, and respect are, are important. But, in, but one I want to point out is collaboration because TEDCO doesn't See itself as, as needing to, to do everything in this community. We have, a, we have a diverse ecosystem with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of different players, many of which are going to be speaking today. And TEDCO wants to, wants to take a, play a role in collaborating and bringing those different organizations together to, again, to, to raise, raise the, the seas, raise all the ships, raise the tide, right? Um, so let me, let me get into specifically into our programs, if I can get the next slide. I, I think of, go back one more, please. I, 
Thank you. I, I think of TED, TEDCO as sort of three, three sort of pillars of, of what we do. And the first pillar is really technology transfer. Again, going back to our roots to transferring technologies out of the universities and federal labs in the region. And we have a number of, number of programs that do that. So for example, our, our Maryland Stem Cell Research Fund actually has six different programs within it that focus on you know, basic research in the stem cell field to commercialization, technology validation, even, even clinical, uh, clinical trials. And this is, this is eligible for anybody working in, in uh, the stem cell area. And, and also even for companies outside of Maryland, if they're doing clinical trials within Maryland, this program can support it. We also have the Maryland Innovation Initiative, which is an, again, a tech transfer program focused on the five major research universities in the state of Maryland. So College Park, University of Maryland, Baltimore, uh, UMBC, Morgan State, Johns Hopkins. And this has two programs within it. One is to, to sort of validate the technologies while they're still in the universities. And then one to make investments in startup companies that are spinning out of, out of the, the universities. It's been a very successful program. I think we've got almost 100 companies that have been started during, during the tenure and those companies have gone on to raise a half a billion dollars in follow on investment. We also have our federal technology transfer programs. And within that right now, we have a, a program funded out of NIST to, to try to, for, for postdocs and other staff within NIST who are trying to spin out companies, we can provide some support for those companies. But we also have a, an SBIR workshop, uh, our proposal, our SBIR proposal lab, where we invite companies in and we actually work with them to, to develop their SBIR proposals so, and at the end of the lab, they actually submit to, to their, their program. So again, all of these to sort of transfer technologies out of, the, out of the universities and federal labs. Next slide, please. So in, in addition to sort of the, the, the tech transfer, the, the second really pillar is really about supporting entrepreneurs in our region and again, empowering the entrepreneurs to be successful. And we've, we've building and we continue to build a variety of resources in this effort. You know, on, you know, one of the first places that we send folks are our educational resources on our webpage. And we, have, we actually have an assessment tool where companies can go in and answer a number of questions and then find out where they stand sort of in, in their ability to compete for funding for our seed funds, but or even for other angel funds. And that also identifies where their weaknesses are. So they know what they need to work on to kind of be, become more competitive. We have business planning resources. One of, one of the great resources we have are our databases, our market search databases where entrepreneurs can come in and get access to Frost and Sullivan and global data to, to generate the, the data, the, the important, the information they need, the data that they need to, to support their business plan and developing it. We run a startup orientation program that sort of talks about the different resources that are around in, in, in the region and at TEDCO, but also helping entrepreneurs understand what investors are looking for and, and how to approach investors. We have a prelude pitch where we invite companies to come in to, to get a little in, in sort of an informal setting so that they can see a couple of pitches and they can get critique on their pitches. But it also gives TEDCO an opportunity to see the company and figure out what resources would be, be a best fit for them and we can help make that match. We have a strong advisory network where we can connect our, our various advisors to, to companies because that's, you know, for, for many entrepreneurs working alone, you really would love to get some advice and, and we can connect you with the right kind of advice. We have a variety of partners, you know, with, um, with, with Amazon Web Services, for, for example, um, and, and other resources that we, we try to, to collect so that we can uh, make those available to entrepreneurs in our region. Executive roundtables, bringing entrepreneurs together so they can talk about their challenges with other entrepreneurs it has been very valuable. We have a rural business program as well to address the, the rural parts of the state. And that's really a mentoring program, but they have project funding and, and also some, some early stage investments there as well that I'll, I'll talk about. So next slide, please. The third pillar for TEDCO are really our investments. Uh, we, we have three levels of investments, you know, pre-seed, seed investments, and then early stage venture capital. Keep in mind that these, these programs, all of our programs, we're focused on technology-based businesses and a technology-based business is one that is, um, it, 
relies on intellectual property for, for the most part to, to give it some kind of a competitive advantage. And, and we, we have a clear definition in our regulations, but, but generally it's, we're, we're looking for technology-based companies and, and you know, life science, not, not just IT technology, but, but all kinds of technologies. For all of our funding programs, we have an online portal where you can apply. You, you still have an application, submit a slide deck or executive summary, and, and there's a process that it gets reviewed and we, we provide feedback so that you, so that even if you, if you don't get an investment, you get feedback to help you, uh, help you improve the company so that maybe you'll, you'll get a, a, have a better chance of competing for the funding at, at, the, at the next time you apply. So let me have the next slide, please. And this, is, this slide sort of lays out all of our, our different funding programs. And at the bottom sort of are, are a couple of tech transfer programs, the Maryland Innovation Initiative and the STEM Cell. Those are, you know, when we, we funding to the university, those are in the form of grants, but when we provide funding to companies, we, we do investments. And in the pre-seed investments, we have the RBI pre-seed, which is about a $25,000 investment. And again, these are the rural parts, these are for the rural parts of, of Maryland and you you have to be a company that is being mentored by one of our RBI representatives uh, for, to, to be eligible for that. The Pre-Seed Builder Fund is focused on socially or economically disadvantaged companies. And it's, uh, it provides an investment of $50,000. And that's, I think that's open right now, actually. So if you go on our website, I think that you can apply for that, that funding or, or will be soon. And then we move into our seed investment funds, which make investments of $100,000 to $500,000. And there are a variety of pools of, of money within the seed funds that we can pull from. So there's some dedicated to cybersecurity, some dedicated to life science, but there's others that are, are just for general funds for other technology-based businesses. And then we have our gap fund within that, which, which provides the funding of up to $500,000 to help companies really at, at, to grow a little bit. And ideally then you move on to the Maryland Venture Fund, which is, which is really sort of um, series A Financing for, for companies will we'll make an initial investment of 750,000 with follow on investments up to 1.25 million in that fund. And that's often with uh, syndicated, syndicated funds. We may partner with other funding, funding uh, the other VCs or angels or other funding organizations, even within the state, to try to make sure the company gets enough funding to really achieve its milestones. So, as you see, we, we've sort of laid out our. our funding programs to sort of go from the translational research all the way to the scale up and the growth. Next slide, please. Here are some examples of uh, some of the companies that we've invested in, in Prince George's County. And, and this is just a, a subset of some of the companies. I know, I know Jelly is, is, was the name of the company we invested. It's now Medcura, um, but, but uh, great, great companies growing up in our region in Prince George's, in, in Prince George's County. Next slide. Last thing I, I want to I want to mention is our Entrepreneur Expo, and this is a, a large event. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hold it this year, this fall, because of COVID. But we do have it on the schedule for next next fall at you know in Prince George's County at the Hotel at the University of Maryland. It, you know, we get a thousand people at this. We have in the past with exhibitors and parallel sessions. It's it's a great networking session, um, pitches, all, all kinds of stuff. So I would encourage you to to save the date on your calendar for. October 13th in 2021. Next slide. And you know, th I thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. At least I don't know if we do it now or we do it at the end, uh, but my contact information is here. I'd be happy for folks to reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And I do wanna say um, Tedco is our partner. If you're not familiar with Tedco, Tedco is unique to Maryland. So this is a, a General Assembly uh, designated entity, correct? Um, that has special funding. And so Tedco is a special and unique entity to the state of Maryland. So it is our, um, our resource to support our technology uh, companies. So Steve, I don't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat. If not, we'll, we'll move on to the next um, session, but I would just say, please take a look at the TEDCO um, website. As you can see, it's TEDCO MD, I believe is the website address. And so there's Steve's contact information as well. He can connect you to 
resources um, within the Technology Development Corporation. We have hosted their Prelude Pitch event and other things in Innovation Station. And we really just want to thank TEDCO for being our partner in Prince George's County to all the local business incubators and to our economic development agencies. Okay, um, thank you. Yep. And Jay, I see you want to talk about hub zones, but we'll be talking about that offline. I can talk to you about that offline. Um, our next presenter today, uh, we have with us Mike Kelleher, and I'm really pleased to have Mike with us joining us today. He has um, been just a tremendous resource to us here in Prince George's County. We have many young entrepreneurs in the manufacturing space, and um, he has done a number of meetings with our companies recently. And so we thought it was important to have Mike Kelleher from the, the Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership present today. Mike, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Alicia. And you can actually go to the next slide. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting me to speak today and for having me as, as part of the Entrepreneur Week. We're really excited to, to be able to present and share a little bit about what we do. Um, for those of you that may not know, again, my name is Mike Kelleher. I'm the Executive Director of the Maryland MEP, which is the Manufacturing Extension Partnership. We're actually a nonprofit based here in Maryland. Um, that is focused on providing services to support the manufacturing community. Uh, we work very much in partnership with industry, and we really sit in the space between federal, state, and local government. So for manufacturers and entrepreneurs and startups that are trying to navigate what resources might be available for, from the federal government or the state government um, related to supporting the manufacturing community, that's really where the MEP comes into play. Um, we are a statewide organization. Uh, we work with the nearly 4,000 manufacturers that are proud to make it in Maryland. And we're very much built on outreach partnership and engagement partnership is in our name. Next slide, Alicia. One of the real uh, powerful uh, resources that the MEP brings to the state of Maryland is we are a part of the MEP national network. Uh, many people don't realize that the MEP system is a federal agency. It's a federal organization uh, based out of NIST in Gaithersburg, and they provide funding to 51 MEP centers around the country. So every state, as well as Puerto Rico, uh, has an MEP center, and the, these MEP centers collectively work to grow manufacturing in the U.S., and why this is so important and such an incredible resource for entrepreneurs and manufacturers and startups is we have access to those other 50 MEP centers. So when companies approach our, our Maryland MEP team and they're looking for contract manufacturers or suppliers or other resources that might be able to help them, if we can't find those resources in Maryland, obviously our first choice is, is to look local um, in, the, in the county that the companies are in or in the, even within Maryland. But if we can't find those resources in the state, we have access to tap this, this pipeline of knowledge from across the country and get introductions and, and access into companies throughout the country. Um, and it's, it's really been beneficial and we've been able to connect companies across the country to grow their supply chains, grow their customer bases, and really connect them with the resources that will help them succeed and grow. Next slide. Uh, a little bit about what manufacturing is in Maryland. I get this question almost on a daily basis where people will ask, what is Maryland known for? Um, when you look across Maryland based on, on what data you might look at, there are nearly 4,000 manufacturing organizations. Obviously, if, if you ask folks to name, there's some of the big ones that we all know. Uh, up in Baltimore, you've got Domino Sugar and McCormick. Down in Prince George's County, you've got the likes of Eight O'Clock Coffee and some of the Northrop Grumman facilities. Um, but Maryland is really a set of diverse industries. Um, we have no single sector that, that pops up to the level of density that some of the other cities or some of the other states around the country might have. Uh, we are very heavy in defense manufacturing and defense contracting, but even there we see electronics and we see plastics and we see composites. So it's, it's really a, quite a diverse set of manufacturing stakeholders and companies that we have in the state. We do have a pretty high concentration of food and beverage manufacturing, and, and certainly um, 
the bio and pharmaceutical manufacturing as well. And, and I think this diversity is what really lends credit and, and makes Maryland's manufacturing community so strong is we are, are really high-tech manufacturing. We're high-tech problem solvers. Um, and the manufacturing industry in itself employs more than 100,000 workers across the state with an average annual wage of right around $90,000. Um, this is, is really important as we try to grow and change the image of manufacturing in Maryland and promote it as a, a viable opportunity and a viable resource for economic development within the state. We obviously want to grow the businesses. We want to keep our manufacturers here. We want to help our entrepreneurs and startups keep that manufacturing here so we can grow that manufacturing economy. Um, the manufacturing ecosystem is also a piece that makes our manufacturing environment so strong. Many of the, the partners you'll hear from today and the speakers that you'll hear from today, the Maryland MEP is proud to call partners of our own. Alicia mentioned Prince George's County and Maryland MEP. We've collaborated on a number of, of events and programming over the years to really support this community. Um, but when you look across Maryland, we are, we are deep with, with resources and knowledge and talent uh, that we can bring to bear on the manufacturing community to support it in whatever means necessary. Uh, we just heard from Ted Co, who's a great resource for, for funding and support and some of their executive coaching programs. Uh, but as you look across the state, we have access to not only financial resources and talent resources, but there are programs and, and, and processes to help companies at every stage of their business life cycle. And the Maryland MEP can help you tap into these, uh, these, these resources as you grow your business. A little bit about Maryland MEP and how we work with companies. We do work with companies of all sizes, uh, everything from the single shingle entrepreneur who has an idea for a product or has, has the makings of a product that they're looking for support on, on up to the, the larger companies that we have in our state. And we really try to break our business services into four main areas. Um, the bottom of the, the, the graph here is really your operational excellence. I like to think of this as the plant floor type activities. So we will work with manufacturers of all sizes to help them produce more goods faster and at better quality. How do we pro push more product through the plant? Um, on the top of the graph, uh, this is something that has been exciting to watch as, as the, the nature of the projects and the nature of how our manufacturing enterprises are engaging over the last several years has been really a focus on business growth. Uh, at Maryland MEP, we always want to facilitate this group, facilitate this growth, and it's through projects like strategic planning or transitioning the family business to the next generation or really helping the startups grow and scale their manufacturing processes and scale their manufacturing markets so that we can create a, a more sustainable and a healthier business environment for those companies. And then the other two sides of the, the equation, very much we are focused on technology adoption and technology implementation. Uh, if you look at the state of Maryland, uh, we don't necessarily com compete on the commodity basis, the commodity production, but where we excel is the high tech manufacturing, the highly technical uh, problem solving. Uh, our manufacturers are, are doing things that are cutting edge and, and really enabling them to compete against some of our neighboring states, as well as some, some of the other countries around the world because we're able to do it more efficiently, uh, better using technology and, and, and processes to compete. And then finally on the workforce and organizational development, um, helping manufacturers grow and scale their businesses. As entrepreneurs uh, and inventors begin to, to scale up, they need to bring in talent, they need to bring in resources. And Maryland MEP can help you, you know, not only bring that talent in, but also grow the talent that you have through training, through career development, um, making sure that you're able to check those boxes at every level of the organization. Uh, some of the resources we have for manufacturers, um, for COVID impacted businesses, uh, the MEP has received CARES funding through the Manufacturing Extension Partnership nationwide. So we're there to work with small businesses to, to conduct a small business assessment help you position 
your business to either recover from COVID or take advantage of opportunities that may be presented. Um, we have funding at the MEP to support training. Uh, that's training for incumbent workers as well as supporting advanced manufacturing training. And recently we've launched a community-based jobs connection program to really bridge the gap between manufacturers with need uh, to the community-based organizations that may have access to, to individuals or displaced workers or others looking for, uh, looking for job opportunities. And the last two, uh, cybersecurity is something where the state of Maryland has been at the forefront from the very beginning. Um, in Prince George's County, we have a good number of defense contractors, uh, be it individuals or small organizations on up to some of the large that are forced to comply with the requirements for cybersecurity compliance in order to continue to serve the DOD. Uh, the Maryland MEP has developed our Defense Cybersecurity Assistance Program in partnership with the Department of Commerce. And this provides funding directly to the companies to improve their cybersecurity compliance. Uh, and, and really, when you look at Maryland, we've been able to partner this up with our cybersecurity resource providers, of which Maryland has the highest concentration across the country of, of firms and organizations that are there to help provide mitigation assistance to companies related to cybersecurity. And finally, uh, specific to the, the resources for startups and entrepreneurs, um, Alicia can attest, she and I talk almost on a, a weekly basis and Maryland MEP is, is, we can go back one more on that one. Sorry, Alicia. Um, she can attest to the fact that she and I talk almost on a weekly basis, exchanging notes uh, and opportunities for small businesses, startups and entrepreneurs that have a need for manufacturing support. Um, we have seen that for entrepreneurs that are just beginning in this process, finding reliable and, and, and trusted resources in the manufacturing space can often be some of the most challenging things. Um, so in that market, in that space, Maryland MEP can serve as a strategic business advisor, helping these companies navigate the, navigate the sector. Uh, we also work to help startups and entrepreneurs identify contract manufacturers, mentors, uh, protégés that can help them through this production process. How do I go from producing a few hundred, a few dozen or a few hundred units of my product to scaling that to something that can support long-term growth? Um, we try our best to connect them with resources in Maryland, but often we might not have those. So we can look outside to our neighboring states in Virginia and Pennsylvania and Delaware. And if we don't see it there, we can, we can look nationwide to companies that have the expertise and ability to, to support that. Um, and again, we're, we're there as a resource um, to provide training. We can help mentor, we can, we can connect on the supply chain side. Um, all of those things are there for the small business and the entrepreneur to help them grow and scale their business. And I think that is my last slide, Alicia. Let's go to the next slide, Lori. Um, if, if anyone is interested, I can take you through MEP's process for supporting the startup. Really, we want to make sure, much like our other providers and, and partners on the phone, that you receive, you know, good feedback and good guidance at every step of the way. Um, the, the graphic here just talks through a little bit about how our process works and how we work with companies. Um, and I'm happy to provide more information if anyone would like additional uh, after the fact. And, and if we get to the next slide, I think we'll have Mike's contact information. We can skip this one, Alicia. Okay, so there you go. So everybody's gonna get the, the PowerPoint slide decks. Obviously, as I've said, um, we have a lot of really in-depth resource partners here um, with a lot of programs. So I encourage everybody to go to the individual sites of all of these organizations presenting today and um, to actually take a look a little deeper. Does anybody have any questions of Mike Kelleher specifically? I know that some people were looking for prototyping and I do wanna mention that Harbor Design um, can help with prototypes as well as there are our 3D printer um, companies in our area that can help with um, prototypes as well. Um, and so we're gonna to move to the next speaker. 
Um, and again, everybody can know that you can still put questions in the chat as we move forward. Um, we'll get to all of those. And I wanna thank the speakers for staying on. So next we have Rod Bourne, who is representing Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. And so this is a great program um, and open to uh, Prince George's County based companies. So Rod, without further ado, take it away. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, Alicia. Pleasure to be here and hi everybody. Um, my name is Rod Bourne. I work with Goldman Sachs in their 10,000 Small Businesses program. Next slide. Next slide. Yep. Next. So the program is designed for small business owners to go through an educational process that, in my opinion, is a total game changer. So if you are in one of the 20 regions in the United States, and for Prince George's County, that is the Maryland group, you are eligible to apply for free. It is a free program, but it is highly competitive to get into. And pre-COVID and post-COVID, the way that the system works is that you attend one full day once a week for approximately 16 weeks. We run this program three times a year from January to April, from May to August, and from September to December. During COVID, we are doing this all online and the format is slightly different where we are meeting for one to two hours on Monday and Friday mornings online. Occasionally there's a Wednesday morning also. The program is designed so that small business owners can work on their best growth opportunity. And what that means is that you may have several segments of what it is that you do, but we want you to take a look at and focus on building out the best opportunity for you to improve your revenue and hire more people. Those are the two main things that Goldman Sachs uses to measure the success in the program is how much more revenue have you generated after going through the program and how many more people from your immediate area have you hired? So the program offers business and management education in the first column there. The program was designed by Babson University and essentially Goldman Sachs went to them. They're a top entrepreneurial school. Babson developed the program. It's now being taught in 20 locations throughout the nation. The one in Maryland typically is based out of Baltimore City. It is right off of the Johns Hopkins campus. You come in early pay for your parking, they pay for your food, and you are there to study and learn and develop your program for the entire day. They provide access to capital, not in the sense that Goldman Sachs will be there with a wallet ready to hand you money as you are graduating from the program, but essentially it is accessing you to various lending sources. We have one program in which we talk about how to hire and fire your banker and how to find lending sources. We have some programs that have guest speakers and panelists come in. For example, we'll have someone from a couple of traditional lenders and banks and some non-traditional lenders. So that is the access to capital. And then business support services. One of the best parts of this program is while you're learning, you are granted access to a business advisor, or BA, essentially a business coach that you have to meet with a minimum of five times throughout your stint in the program, which again lasts three months. And that business coach is a very, very sharp individual that will really get you to focus and ask some very hard questions to help you make the best decisions for growing your business. Next slide. So the program goes through these nine steps, but the nine steps, each one has approximately two sessions to it. So you have your orientation, and then we talk about you and your business. And again, we want you to focus on the best growth opportunity for your business. It can be any kind of business. We do a financial statement workshop. We talk about money and metrics. We talk about leadership and how you handle the people kind of from a legal uh, standpoint. We talk about marketing and selling. We talk about negotiating. We talk about being bankable. And then putting it all together so that you have a very workable action plan for growth as you leave. Next slide. 
So since the inception of the program, which was about a dozen years ago, the program has had 100,000, excuse me, over 10,000 small business people go through it nationwide. In Maryland, we've had over 350 people since we arrived here about three years ago. In total, all of the 10,000 plus businesses represents a total of $9 billion in revenue growth since they started the program and a hiring of over 130,000 people. The business age range is from two years to 159 years with a median age of 12 years. So on average, companies that go through our program are about 12 years old. The average number of employees for those 12 year old companies is about 11 and median revenue is about three quarters of a million dollars. Now the minimum, the minimum for the Maryland based program is two years in business two people on payroll, and that can include the owner, and 100,000 in revenue. So let me repeat that. Two years in business, two people on payroll, which can include the owner, and 100,000 in revenue. And during this stretch when we're dealing with COVID, they're relaxing that just a little bit. So if you are just under 100,000, I encourage you still to apply. They will look at your application. Next slide. So this talks about the success of the folks who have gone through. And you can see that after the six, 18 and 30 month periods, the growth in both revenue and the growth in job rates. And those are the two measurements. So I wasn't perfectly honest when I said that it's absolutely free. There is a little bit of payback. At the six, 18 and 30 month period after graduating the program, we ask that you respond and give the numbers for that, uh, for those two growth measurements so that we can measure how well all of our alumni are doing. Next slide. So a couple of key points that people get out of the program, the employee benefits um, that grow from company growth, the collaboration, which in all honesty is, in my opinion, probably the best takeaway because as you're going through this program, you're going through with uh, 39 other business owners. So it's 40 per cohort. So it's approximately 120 per year that go through this. And you work very intently with a small group in each so you'll walk away knowing 39 more business owners and four of them extremely well because they're kind of your growth family, as we call it. Innovation comes from this. We really work on your best growth opportunity. How are you going to innovate to get to that area? And mentorships, because people develop mentorships with the people that they meet in the program, whether they are scholars that are there with them or people that they meet going through the program. We have on average nationwide, a 98.5% program completion rate. It's higher than that here in Maryland. And on a national average, over 87% uh, of people do business together. And again, in Maryland, our numbers are higher. Next. So as I mentioned, the typical business criteria, you need to be the owner or co-owner of the business. You need to have been in operations for at least two years with revenues above $100,000 and at least two employees and a desire to grow and create jobs in your area. A really bad applicant is someone who is looking to retire and sell their business and go down to the Caribbean. <laughs> Don't want folks like that. We want folks who, who are going to focus on building their company and staying with their company. Next slide. So. The way that this proceeds, if you are interested, there's a two-stage application process. It's all online, and I'd be more than happy to share with you the link for that. But the first part of the application online just is looking for basic business information. The second part, you need to upload your financials. As long as you're doing something that is similar to QuickBooks, you're fine. 
If you need assistance with this, we are more than willing to help get people for you to help get those financials in line for you. Then after the application is uploaded, we take a look at those. We typically have anywhere between 100 to 150 apply for each cohort. We typically invite about 60 to 80 to interview for those 40 seats. And those are 30 minute interviews. Next slide. So some local scholars and graduates, folks from the PG County that you may uh, know are right here. Hopefully you recognize at least one or two of them. Next slide. So if you have any questions, I would be more than happy to answer them. Uh, and there is my contact information. Our next cohort starts in January, but that one is already full. We are now looking for people for the May cohort, which runs May through August. We are willing to take people who want to defer that and start in September of 2021. Thanks a lot. Rod, why don't you put into the chat um, the information uh, related to the link that you mentioned. If and Steve, if you want to put in there the, the link for TEDCO and um, Mike Kelleher, you might also want to add into the chat the links to, um, to your sessions. Rod, thank you so much. 10,000 Small Businesses, Goldman Sachs program. It's a great program. It's a great way to grow your business. As, as you've seen, we've had some great graduates from that located here in Prince George's County. So we're really pleased that all of our speakers are highlighting our Prince George's County entrepreneurs and innovators that have taken advantage of these programs as well as dynamic small businesses. I don't see any questions in the chat at this point, so we're going to head on to our next speaker. And I want to welcome Claire Johnson from the University of Maryland, uh, Maryland Momentum, sorry, University System of Maryland, Maryland Momentum Fund. Thank you, Claire, for being here. And uh, I know she's a rock star. So let's hear what what this is all about. And again, this is about resources and understanding what kind of resources are out there to our community. So if you're an alumni or others related, and Claire's gonna get into this, but so listen up everybody, cause there may be funding available to you. Claire, turning it over to you. Thanks so much, Alicia. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Prince George's County that you have a fantastic lineup. I'm really happy to hear from Mike and Stephen and Rod and, and I will look forward to hearing from the other Mike. It's, it's really good. This is a really uh, thorough review of the resources available in Maryland. So thank you. My name's Claire Broido Johnson. I'm the managing director of the Maryland Momentum Fund. Next slide. So we're a $10 million fund that was created by the University System of Maryland. Uh, which consists of 12 universities across the system. It was established by the Board of Regents and investments started in 2017. I came on as managing director in July of 2019 and uh, in total we've made 23 investments, 13 since I joined. Our goal is uh, to generate at least $15 million in co-investment. So essentially my goal is twofold. I want to invest in promising early stage technologies affiliated with the university system and make money and also support the development of the ecosystem. So we do work quite a lot with Tedco and Mike Ravenscroft and lots of people um, on this call and wanna collaborate more. I mean, all of us are here because we wanna support early stage startups and build the entrepreneurial ecosystem across Maryland and of course in Prince George's County. So we're all really you know, excited about supporting entrepreneurs at all sizes and stages. Um, so we help promising early stage companies bridge the early stage funding gap, getting to them to a point where they can raise additional funding with VCs or be acquired. So the important thing with me is that we do have a lot of limiting factors. So the company must be based in Maryland and we require that an inv investor invest at least as much as we invest in. So um, right now I'm at about a 4.5 to one ratio. So for every dollar that I've invested, someone else has invested $4.5 in the equivalent of all of those rounds. Um, we require an affiliation with the university system, which could be met by one of three things. Either it's university owned intellectual property from one of our 12 universities, or the company has been founded by a professor, student, faculty or alum from one of our 12 universities. 
or the companies located and a university affiliated re research park or incubator. That could be IMET, that could be lots of different places. And if you have any questions, of course, ask me. But we do have those very specific eligibility criteria. Next slide. Great. Why is this fund lead needed? And I think that this, you know, this is consistent across a lot of the people speaking today. Um, there's a lack of risk-taking investors in Maryland compared to other places like Boston or Silicon Valley in the sense that most investors around here have made their money or most angel investors or, or entrepreneurs who have lots of money have made their money on real estate and manufacturing. We don't have a lot of Facebook or Amazon alum in the Maryland markets. We have a high percentage of employees in the DMV that are government employees, not entrepreneurs. Um, there's also a capital chasm. So there's a variety of early stage, really early seed capital investors and grants that are available. And you're seeing a lot of those today on this call. Um, and there's significant downstream investors. So once a company's made a lot of progress and they're either in series B or series C, there's investors. There's not a lot in the middle, um, to be perfectly honest. And I, I welcome co a conversation about that. But I think, you know, there is a capital chasm. Um, and then there's also a lack of middle level and high level managers. And this is, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there's all, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of people who get moved away, to be perfectly honest. So there's more opportunities and more for, with more companies in New York City and Silicon Valley and in Boston. So we see a great sucking sound. So as you know, a lot of companies do really, really well. And at some point, a venture capitalist says, wow, that was a really nice science project, but my head of marketing or my CFO or my head of sales is based in Menlo Park. So it's time for you to move to Menlo Park. And a lot of people do that. And so, you know, I think this fund is needed among a lot of other funds to help stimulate investment, teach early stage entrepreneurs how to pitch and build business plans and raise money and try to keep people around here. I do see a question about where are the university affiliated research parks or incubators located. You can find that at our website, which is just momentum.usmd.edu. Um, next slide. please. So here's the investments we've made to date. Um, Again, I joined in July of 19, but we've invested in lots of different things. We've invested in med tech, we've invested in wood burning stoves, in caffeinated tea products, in jet propulsion engines, um, in life sciences, therapeutics. We've invested in a wearable tourniquet, in building management systems, um, in more education technologies, in a blood cell substitute. Um, and we are starting to do follow on rounds. So we've invested $5.4 million and committed more. We have a $27 million external match. Um, our average investment size is around 270. We invest typically somewhere between 150 and 500, but that's our average size. And the average total round size for all of these people who have raised money with us and others is 1.5 million. And our co-investors are on the lower right. And as lots of people, um, uh, you know, are, are getting involved, we're finding more and more co-investors. We also keep a reserve fund aside so that we can do follow-on investments. And I've got $3 million in a reserve fund. So we're starting to get to the point where we're running out of money, um, just as an FYI. Uh, next step. Oh, and I'm sorry, before you go to the next slide, a number of these are based in PG County. So, um, Let's see, we've got Retrium and Paver Guide, I believe, and Five Sensors, and a new one that we're investing in, um, Visasonics, all based in PG County. So, you know, really happy to be involved with PG County. Next slide. Uh, here's more about our portfolio companies and how they're connected with the university system. So we have alum, we have intellectual property, we have faculty, we have, you know, Calocyte is uh, at the Biopark, University of Maryland, Baltimore Biopark. Um, UMD College Park has a huge set of incubators. There's lots of facilities there. Um, so, you know, we've got Towson alum, there's a Towson incubator. Um, so any of those would apply. And again, if you're a, uh, if you are a professor, student or alum from any of the 12 universities, you are also eligible to apply. Next slide process to apply is all on our website. So you can 
you can do a little bit more digging that way, but you would submit an application to me. You could submit it on our website or you can just email me. We'd verify that you, you know, meet our qualifications. We would do some due diligence. One of the things that's really important to us is we put together an expert panel. Because we're industry agnostic, I'm looking at aquaculture to education technology to med tech to jet propulsion engines to drones. And so one of the things we really rely upon at the University System of Maryland is our large quantity of experts in all of these different fields. And I also bring in potential investors, entrepreneurs in the space, potential partners or existing partners. And we have a big um, you know, 10, 15, 20 person expert panel in which the entrepreneur uh, provides uh, a, a, a deck and we dig into questions like intellectual property, competition, exit strategies, all of that good stuff. Then we present to our advisory board. Our advisory board uh, consists of people who are not affiliated with the university system, but that provide advice to us. Um, they're entrepreneurs, they're serial investors, they're all sorts of people from across the industry. They're people who are managing VCs. We do follow up and then have an executive committee presentation. So those are the people within the university system of, of Maryland that have the fiduciary responsibility for signing the check. And then we make the investment. And that process can be, you know, take as long as you want if it takes a long time to go through your data room, but it can be as short as two months. Next slide. And then in terms of, you know, I, th I think this maybe is not quite as relevant to this group, but just to be clear, in terms of what we require from entrepreneurs, we definitely require an elevator pitch. So I found one of the things that I found most interesting about the Maryland entrepreneurs I've seen thus far is there's a lot of people who can't really give an elevator pitch, which is really in the time you're in an elevator when people used to take elevators, you know, what's the 36, 30 second pitch about why you're important, why I should care and what problem it's solving. So if you can't tell your grandmother or your grandkid or you know, anybody on the street, what your company actually does in 30 seconds or less, it's important to get to a point where you can do that. And then these are all the things that we require to review a company, which I believe is true of almost any investor in the world. Customer traction, technology status, uh, risks, company timeline, the team, use of funds, competition, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. Investment criteria, a lot of people ask about this. We require information about map market traction. So that's very different depending on the industry vertical and life sciences. You might have gotten an SBIR grant or you might be getting some NSF funding, but you're very far from commercialization. For a you know, consumer product, we need to see revenue um, and how many stores you're selling to and how many products you're offering and where you're, who your channel partners are. We need to see a strong management team that's coachable um, my very first criteria is, is the, is the team coachable? Because if they're not, I'm not going to make an investment in them. Um, we need to see excellent, unique business ideas with clear, actionable milestones and clear goals with good partners and a clear potential exit and a clarity on the risks and how they'll be mitigated. Next slide. Um, here's a, a just sort of what to do and not do for entrepreneurs. Do not spend more than one slide on the market size. Um, I have found across Maryland that people spend 10, 15 slides on explaining why their market's so important. And that is, you know, it's, it's relevant for one slide. And then you really need to dig into what it is that your company does. Uh, never send a deck more than 10 megabytes. That's just annoying. <laughs> and don't say that you have no competitors. Everyone has a competitor. And do detail exactly how much you're raising. Uh, do explain your ideal customer and your customer acquisition costs. Do describe how your solution solves a problem and convince us that people want to pay for that solution. And do explain why you're better than the competition. Next slide. I think I'm going to pass on this one, but basically, you know, what, what are we judged based on? And we're judged based on getting long-term financial returns and expanding economic development across the state of Maryland. And then, of course, because this money comes from the University System of Maryland, we care a lot about commercializing our IP and stimulating and improving the visibility of USMIP and our professors, students, and alum. And we're also really keen on keeping our recent graduates and, you know, long-term graduates in the state of Maryland. We want to support and recruit and retain innovative students and faculty and keep everybody here in Maryland. Next slide. Uh, final advice to companies that are, are thinking about pitching is just be enthusiastic and passionate. Um, I am 
really bummed out when people are not excited about presenting their company. Um, know your audience, be brief, uh, don't be defensive and be clear on why and how your team can execute. Next slide. That's it. So I will put my contact information uh, in the chat room and thank you very much. I hope you all reach out to me. Thanks. And I just want to thank Claire because we have entrepreneurs and innovators coming to us who are Bowie State University graduates, right? And others who may have gone to the University of Maryland Global Campus and other campuses. So I think it's really important for people to realize in Prince George's County, if you attended University of Maryland College Park, University of Maryland Global Campus, um, Bowie State University, and are an alumni, you may be eligible for this fund um, if you're meeting their requirements because you are an alumni of that institution. Correct, Claire? Um, I've That's got correct. that right. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. So again, this is just, you know, we want to bring resources to Prince George's County and make sure that, that our Prince George's County businesses and entrepreneurs and innovators are aware of all the resources out there. So thank you, Claire. Thank um, you. Again, I didn't see any specific questions other than the, the university incubators, and we can connect you to those, as can Claire. Next up, we have Mike Rosencraft, who is coming to, to tell us a little bit more about the Dingman Center Angels, which are located at the University of Maryland campus. And so right here in Prince George's County, again, we're going to be Prince George's County proud today. So um, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Sure thing. Thanks, Alicia. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. I'm looking forward to, to, to doing this. Um, I uh, just want to start by saying um, it's uh, really um, a thrill to sit on this panel alongside um, so many important resources in the region. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, uh, as entrepreneurs, the important thing to take away from this conversation is um, that there is not just one or two sources of capital that you need to bring to bear uh, in order to start a business, but there's really a network that you need to draw from. Um, and I think that that's why it's valuable to have all of these um, folks on the call uh, today. Um, so um, I just want to give a quick uh, overview of angel investing because I think, um, you know, a lot of what we do at Dingman is, is somewhat different from um, what the, the rest of the folks on the on the um, uh, call have been uh, have been talking about. Um, so if you sort of think about the continuum of innovation from publicly traded companies on the one side to somebody tinkering in their garage or in a university lab on the other, um, uh, Dingman Center Angels uh, is sort of an angel group is sort of um, just to the right of um, that sort of university uh, or garage level tinkering. Um, so uh, I was trying to think of a metaphor. Steve used the metaphor of an ecosystem or a forest earlier. Um, so the metaphor for angel investing that I use sometimes is, if you ever seen penguins gathered on an ice floe, um, the first penguin to jump into the water, the cold icy water is the entrepreneur. Uh, the second or the third is the uh, the first and second angel investors. Um, so willing to take a lot of uh, early risk up front uh, for potentially high return down the road. Um, so, so getting into that, uh, what is an angel group? Uh, so angel investors are high net worth individuals, often exited entrepreneurs who are um, looking to invest in very early stage companies. And so when we say early stage, we really are talking about um, just after a product has been validated, put into the market and starting to see a little bit of revenue and possibly even before then, some angels invest even earlier. Um, so Dingman Center Angels is a group of angels that invest um, not collectively, but they review companies collectively, meet collectively um, throughout the year to uh, review companies for potential investment. Um, so we were founded in um, 2005. And by the way, I, I, let me just back up because I realized I didn't fully introduce myself. So I'm a second year MBA student. I'm a venture associate with the Dingman Center Angels. And so I work with our director to, uh, to source companies for the, the Angel Network. Um, so we operate out of the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Um, we have been around since 2005. And so we are formally uh, affiliated with the University of Maryland and that we um, review companies uh, as, as, uh, as a, a network that's based at the University of Maryland. Um, our membership uh, is currently uh, over 40 active members. We're actually closer to 50 at this point. Um, mostly high net worth individuals who are uh, themselves exit entrepreneurs. Uh, we par partner with some of the top angel groups uh, in the region uh, for the purposes of identifying early stage companies to invest in. Um, so if you just look at this slide, um, you know, most of the uh, folks on the panel uh, today uh, we have uh, partnered with in some capacity. Um, so we frequently invest uh, alongside Tedco at the very early earliest stage. Um, of uh, technology companies. Um, similarly, uh, as Claire mentioned, um, you know, we uh, look at a lot of the companies that the Merrill Momentum Fund invests in as well, um, specifically um, N5 Sensors, uh, Retrium, two of the companies that, uh, that Claire referenced, 
um, were also Dingman Center Angels uh, investments. Um, and actually, as Steve mentioned uh, before, uh, the company Jelly, that was a Maryland, um, that was a Dingman Center Angels investment as well. Um, so uh, we work pretty actively within the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, we are, uh, like I said, um, looking for companies that are primarily uh, in the Mid-Atlantic. And we like to sort of think of that as anywhere from North Carolina all the way up to um, Northern Maryland, or um, in some cases, New Jersey. Um, but for the most part, um, angels want to invest in their own backyard. And, and that's what we, that's where we look for companies. So pretty much DC, Virginia, and Maryland. Um, we can go to the next slide. So uh, our investment criteria um, really do vary, but you know we are uh, among the earlier um, stages of uh, outside capital investments. So we're looking typically at what we call the growth seed stage. Um, so this is for companies that have a product or service that's been fully developed and is in market generating early revenue. Um, so not necessarily you know two to three million a year in revenue, but um, you know anywhere from um, ten thousand a month in monthly recurring revenue um, to fifty thousand a month in recurring revenue. Um, you know we're really looking for companies that are just about to hit that upswing where they're um, starting to scale uh, and using the investment round that they're going to get from uh, angels networks and other seed stage VCs to to really grow their company. So um, similar to the Momentum Fund, we are sector agnostic. So we have a technology focus in the sense that we're looking for um, technology product companies primarily, um, but we see all different types of companies. So just for our last meeting cycle, we uh, looked at a, a gelato company very closely. Uh, we were looking at a cybersecurity company. We were looking at a company that was doing a, a blockchain um, payment solution for small businesses. Um, really, we're looking for innovation in any form. Um, the differentiator for us uh, tends to be that it's a product company, so a company that has a, a, a specific product or product suite that they're trying to get into market. Um, but beyond that, uh, we are really looking for um, any company that might be a good um, seed stage uh, angel investment for our, for our angels. Um, again, high growth potential um, is uh, pretty much uh, a precursor to any angel investment. So angels are looking for a pretty big payoff down the road um, when a company exits. And so um, typically that's for companies that are operating in a very large market. So as Claire mentioned, um, market size is extremely important in venture. Um, and so we're looking for companies that are looking at a $1 billion plus uh, market size um, and a, a similar uh, uh, kind of rate of return um, for that investment. Um, so typically these are companies that are raising between 200,000 and 2 million uh, in a single round. Um, our investments range from 50 to 500K um, per financing. Our angels invest uh, individually, so not as a special purpose vehicle. This is each individual person putting his or her own money in. Um, and we typically look for companies that are valued uh, at what we call uh, the, the seed stage uh, level of valuation. So typically uh, less than 9 million um, pre-money valuation. Um, typically uh, we see companies that are raising on a convertible note. Um, so those are uh, investments with a, a cap or a conversion cap of um, less than 9 million. Typically the range is between four and seven. Um, we can go to the next slide. So just a quick breakdown of uh, the kinds of investments we make. So um, since we launched, um, we our, our angels have made over 135 investments. In fact, since our uh, meeting cycle started this year, um, we have made closer to 140. Um, the capital invested is over 18 million, uh, and then the outside capital raised is over 700 million. And when I say outside capital, I mean um, money coming from other investors. So whether those are investors in the region or national venture capital firms, um, a lot of outside money raised by the startups that, uh, that we have helped fund. And, and get launched. Um, the breakdown tends to be, uh, you know, what's in the region. So that's the types of companies that are being launched here tend to be software as a service, uh, mostly B2B, um, uh, internet consumer, uh, internet companies, uh, and cybersecurity. Um, there's some ad marketing tech, um, as well as ed tech and health IT. Um, the 10% you see there on the pie uh, that represents other uh, covers all manner of companies. So, you know, we've seen um, uh, in-home uh, smart farming solutions, so, uh, you know, portable uh, smart farms to, like I mentioned before, gelato companies. Um, so just to sort of re-emphasize that we really do look at um, all different types of uh, seed stage product companies that are raising capital. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so just a quick uh, overview of how it works. Um, we screen um, hundreds of companies every year. 
Um, so last year, 2019 to 2020, um, our meetings run on the academic year cycle. So we start our meetings uh, every year in September and they run through June. Um, we screen, uh, last year we screened over 200 companies. Uh, we invited 21 of those to present to our angels. So it's typically two to three uh, each meeting period. Um, and we made nine investments. So uh, these are some of the companies that we've invested in. Um, you'll see there, uh, we have cybersecurity, we have um, health tech, we have uh, a gaming company, Cardboard Live, uh, which is a, a new kind of sort of like Twitch-like gaming platform. Um, we try to find companies, like I said, um, any, any entrepreneur that's innovating and, and launching uh, what appears to be a promising business uh, is something that we'll take a look at. Uh, next slide. So um, part of the reason angels uh, make investments is to get exits. So uh, angels are looking to get their money out of uh, companies within you know, five to eight years of making their initial investment. Um, and the way those exits typically happen is through acquisitions. So you can see here, um, Divi Cloud, uh, cloud enabled um, services company, um, they were acquired uh, last year, or excuse me, earlier this year by Rapid7 for 145 million. Um, these are some of our more notable uh, exits, but we have a number of other um, acquisitions sort of listed here on the side. Um, that really sort of speaks to the, the level of M&A that we uh, look for in the, the types of companies that we're investing in. So most, most of the companies we're looking at are looking at an acquisition. Um, you know, obviously IPO is the dream, but typically companies are acquired well before then. Um, and uh, these are just some of the examples of the companies in the region that we've uh, invested in. Uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, one uh, that you may have heard of, uh, Social Tables, they were founded in 2011. Um, so Dingman Angels put 245,000 in um, at the very early stages. Uh, they sold to Cvent in 2018 for uh, about 100 million. Um, so again, you know, sort of an example of a company where uh, invested early and then seven years later exited, which was a very good result for us. Uh, next slide. Uh, we have a number of companies uh, in our portfolio that are growing rapidly, not yet acquired. So ZeroFox, which some of you may have heard of, is a Baltimore-based cybersecurity company. Um, Cybrary, uh, a cybersecurity uh, training company. Um, a lot of these companies are sort of starting to raise much larger rounds, um, some of which have been invested in uh, by some of our partners on the call as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, let's just go to the next slide after this. So I want to make sure we get to the part that everybody cares about, which is how do you get in front of the Dingman Center Angels? Um, so our screening process uh, is fairly transparent. Um, so between myself uh, and our uh, director, um, Stan Smith, um, we look at companies all the time. So we get referrals from other uh, angel investors. We get referrals from Tedco. We get referrals from uh, Momentum Fund. Um, and then we have uh, cold emails that we, that we respond to um, as we get them. So um, companies that are looking to uh, get in front of the uh, angels network typically go through uh, sort of a long uh, screening process where we get to know the entrepreneur, we get to know the business, um, we see their uh, investment deck, their um, executive summary, and then we conduct a series of review rounds internally to determine which companies we might want to bring in front of the angels. So um, Stan and I do a lot of preliminary diligence on the companies that we want to look at. Um, those that are most promising are selected for a review day, which is a small panel of angels that makes the decision about whether or not to advance companies through to the actual pitch day. And then um, when companies pitch. It's very similar to what Claire described as uh, the pitch process for the Momentum Fund. Um, we bring companies in to pitch uh, for 20 minutes to the angels, um, 10 minutes pitch, 10 minutes Q&A. Um, then angels that are interested in making an investment, we broker a connection and they uh, schedule follow-up meetings to conduct their own due diligence or to continue the conversation with companies. Um, the timeline with an angel network really varies, um, you know, because you're working with individual investors. Uh, it can be anywhere from one day. We've literally seen companies get an investment the same day that they've met an angel investor, um, up to four to five months. You know, sometimes angels might want to wait and see if there's extra investment that comes in uh, before they make an investment. So really what um, Dingman does is broker connections with promising companies to active angel investors uh, and then facilitate that conversation uh, as it moves forward. Um, Typically, multiple angels will invest in a company. Um, you know, venture is a team sport. Um, nobody wants to be the only investor in a company. So oftentimes, our angels will co-invest alongside other angels or alongside other funds uh, in the region. Uh, and then angels uh, typically make follow-on investments in the portfolio companies that are doing well and that they want to follow. Um, you know, one of the important things about um, angel investors that you know is sort of my my take on why it's good as a as a 
um, an entrepreneur just getting started to bring on an angel investor is you're not just bringing on capital, you're bringing on experience and insight and perspective. So often your angel investors will be exited entrepreneurs who have gone through some of the same challenges that you've gone through uh, launching your company. Um, so it can be uh, really helpful to have somebody like that on your team early uh, who can give you advice, perspective and guidance as you start to scale the company. Uh, and we, we think that our angels um, do bring a lot of that to bear. Most of the angels in our network are um, very uh, prominent, uh, active um, uh, advocates for entrepreneurs uh, in, the, in the region um, and take their uh, investments very seriously uh, in the companies that they want to partner with. Um, so I think that is my last slide. Yep. So the next slide, I think, is your contact information. That's right. Um, so yeah, and just uh, I guess one one last thing I'll say. So um, you know, folks can join the Angel Network. Um, I think this is you know an entrepreneur audience. So I think um, I'll, I'll just sort of skip over this one. But my contact information is on the last slide. Um, again, you know, we are always interested in speaking with entrepreneurs. Um, if you just want some information about how the Angel Network works, happy to uh, get on a call and sort of run you through in a bit more detail. Um, but uh, but there's my my email uh, and uh, Stan's email. So feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. So I, I want to thank you, Michael, for that. And um, I do want to note that, you know, Prince George's County, we do have some of the wealthiest individuals um, in the community. So um, there are angel investors in our community that I know are part of the Dingman Angels. And then um, there are others that may join. I know some uh, high net worth investors also just make um, direct investments into local businesses. So I hope everybody knows that what we're trying to do here today, again, uh, as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week is, is highlight some of the resources available to our entrepreneurs. And you can now see whether it's bank funding, the traditional funding, you have to usually be one to three years old before you can actually get some of the bank funding. Um, angel funding, you know, when you're first starting out, you may be putting your own money in, you may be looking for angels. Um, to help you support your business. You may be looking for TEDCO to support with some seed money um, and et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure, and then you might get to Claire, right? So, so let's everybody just understand that this is part of the ecosystem and we're trying to just give everybody an idea of how um, all this interconnects. So I hope I did okay there. And if anybody else, Steve or anybody else wants to jump in to clarify that, um, in any way, shape or form, I'm happy to defer to others. But I think what you're seeing here is we're trying to bring together a number of resources. Um, and even the Maryland Manufacturing Extension Partnership has mentioned that they have resources to help you do market research and other things like that. So next we're going to go to our final speaker because I still don't see any questions. I don't know, people are kind of quiet today, but just know that you have the ability to ask questions in the chat if you do actually have a question or outreach to the individual speaker directly in a private message. And we have with us Ronnie Gist, who um, again is another great treasure in Prince George's County, Maryland, based out of University of Maryland, is the Maryland Industrial Partnerships. Um, this is a statewide um, resource, uh, which Ronnie will further explain how it works. Um, but we've had many successful companies from Prince George's County go through this as well. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ronnie. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. And thank you everyone for joining and, and what a great program. I really have enjoyed it myself. It's been a great, uh, I know most of the programs myself, but to get a brush up on them has been fantastic. So I'll jump in a, a high level, uh, you know, big picture view of MIPS, Maryland Industrial Partnerships is commonly known as MIPS. Uh, has been around since 1987, continuously funded by the state. And I thought I'd start by mentioning the little logo in the upper left of that slide is MTech. That is our institute at the University of Maryland. The Maryland, it's a technology enterprise institute. I see some of my colleagues are online today. Uh, there are many, many programs within MTech to assist entrepreneurs, many on campus as students and faculty, but many for the whole statewide for companies and entrepreneurs too. So please check out the MTech website. Uh, earlier today, someone uh, asked about the incubator on campus, so I put the link to that directly uh, in the chat a little earlier. So I'll discuss today MIPS, which is one of those programs that is of interest to companies and entrepreneurs because we have funding, right? We have grant funding. And our, as many of the others have said today, uh, there's the only catch to this one is we do ask after you have a MIPS award, how are you doing? Did you add some jobs? Did you add revenue uh, for your company? 
But uh, to get back to what it's about, we have funding from the state of Maryland, and it's primarily for economic development, right? And the idea is we are funding research and development for your company, for entrepreneurs, collaboratively, that's the PNMPS is the partnership, between Maryland industry, any company, any entrepreneur in the state, and University System of Maryland faculty researchers from all over the system. You heard in Maryland, in the system, we also fund projects with Morgan State University and St. Mary's College. So it's a great wealth of possible expertise out there. And think of the faculty member for you as a sort of a de facto consultant that we MIPS are funding and helping you to fund. So that's the idea behind it. Uh, we do require a proposal. It's a grant proposal and grant program. We have two deadlines every year, every April every October, excuse me, every May and every October, but this next one will be April 30th, since May 1st falls on a Saturday this year. And those proposals are evaluated on their technical merit by a series of technical set of technical reviewers, and they are uh, reviewed for economic development potential. And that's the primary criteria. You see that's in red there on my slide. Likelihood of long-term job creation in Maryland resulting from this proposed R&D project with a faculty member. The projects are jointly funded by MIPS and the companies. What that means is you are required to put in a cash match for startups, which most of the folks here in this audience, I imagine are startups today. Uh, and I'll talk about that criteria in a minute. Uh, that is a 10% match of up to a $100,000 project per year per company times two possible years. So your possible total funding for your university project budget would be 200K of which the company would owe 10%. I like to emphasize that we do many projects that are less than the max. If you have a project that will help you move your product forward and your company forward, and it's a $64,000 project, then you would owe 6,400 for that match, assuming you win the award. There's no charge whatsoever to apply to MIPS. It's only if you win an award. All of our funding goes to university researchers. You see that last bullet? difference in MIPS and most other grant programs and other funding programs is we are not giving money to the company to operate. We are sending the money directly to the campus you're working with, to that principal investigator, that faculty member, and your 10% match also goes to that researcher. Next slide, please. So real quick overview of what MIPS has meant to the state of Maryland. We're real proud of some of these numbers. Um, very quickly, the ones to draw you into are the revenue generated from MIPS developed products in the state as of the date of this slide was $34.9 billion. It's now approaching $40 billion. We know it's actually even better than that. That's only on companies that have reported back to us. Remember I asked earlier, we, we'd like to hear how you did and how, how, how the project went for your company. And the lower right 63%, a number we're very proud of also, is startups that are still in business that have received MIPS funding since 1987. That's an incredibly high percentage, right? Uh, in, the, in the world of startups, you always hear how, how it's so difficult. We, we are obviously think we do a pretty good job of funding the right ones, right? And they're still in business. Next slide, please. So here's the key points, okay? Maryland companies begin the process, right? You come to us if you have no clue where a university professor might be that might know something about what you're doing, what your technology is. You come to us, it's a big part of what we do is help you with that matchmaking. Some cases you might already know them and we'll, we'll, or know of them, we're happy to make a, make a introduction. Those proposals again are evaluated. The economic developments in bold, it's the most important criteria is how well will the company do adding jobs and creating revenue in Maryland. Those projects are conducted by the faculty in conjunction with company, that's the partnerships. Again, all funding goes toward the university project costs. Next slide. So who's eligible? Any Maryland company of any size. So you don't have to be a startup. We've just recently done projects with Under Armour. We've done many with Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, the biggest companies in the state. They come to the university for the expertise, equipment and facilities often. They don't get the 10%, they pay 50% match. But for, for any company, any size that will add Maryland jobs if the project proves successful. We do have an out-of-state category. I won't go into it here. Uh, it does also require that you show that you're going to grow the, a company location in Maryland, although you don't have to have one today to apply. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the startup criteria. Um, it's, it's almost always of interest. 
the thing you won't see here as you go down those bullets is MIPS has no time in business criteria for startups. We don't care how long you've been working on this. You can have started it 10 years ago in your home office or garage and you worked on it part time. But as of the time you apply to MIPS, we need you to have one full time equivalent employee at least. That one is key, not under one. If you have two partners working on it 50% of their time, perfect. That's one full time equivalent. The point is, someone every day is making this company move ahead. Somebody's working on it all the time and then up to 20 employees. So you can be a company in business. You've already got products, you've got uh, re revenue, you are needing to develop or further develop one of your products or develop a new product. Come to MIPS, you're still a startup as far as we're concerned, if you are under 20 and under 2 million in sales, okay? We do require an executive summary business plan and financial statement balance sheet. Uh, we do not require those, by the way, from the larger companies that the small and large companies that pay a higher percentage of the cost of the project. For a startup though, we do require these. And that 10% cash match I uh, mentioned before, uh, you can't be publicly traded and you must be in good standing with the state of Maryland. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, we went backwards, go forward one more. There you go. Uh, well, nope, too, too many. Back, there we go. So Prince George's County, uh, Alicia had asked me to cover uh, any companies that we had uh, funded recently, we have funded many, many, because we go back to 1987. And given that the pro our program uh, originates and is out of College Park in Prince George's County, you can imagine we have many, but these are the ones just from the last five years that have been awarded uh, that are Prince George's based. And you might notice that a number of these were also on some previous slides from Steve's, uh, from Ted Coe in particular, uh, and I think uh, the Momentum Fund, uh, this is very typical of the Maryland uh, sort of eco, uh, ecosystem for innovation is many folks, uh, companies apply to more than one and are awarded by more than one at different stages of their development, sometimes concurrently, sometimes not. MIPS tends to be earlier stage than some of the others. We're not funding early, early basic research, but we are funding companies that may have just begun their design and are totally pre-revenue and are one person startups. It, it's, it's very often the case. They have to have, you have to have a good business plan. You have to show that you know what you're going to do with the product, assuming the technology is successful, right? So there's a number of those. I'd like to also point out that the campus listing there, you might notice the vast majority of those are UM College Park. You'd expect that. We always look wherever a company's located in the state, if they're in far Western Maryland, we always look at Frostburg first. If they're on the lower Eastern shore of Maryland, we always look at UMES and Salisbury first. But the key is where's the right right professor for you, the right faculty expertise. So you notice most of these are College Park, but there's a couple there from UMBC, and uh, there's at least one, yeah, Optimal Solutions from University of Maryland, Baltimore, the medical school. So we do many, many collaborative projects with campuses all over the system. And I think that's it, next slide. Yeah, that's my contact info in the center there, um, and the MIPS website. Uh, happy to take questions if there are any. Um, and please feel free to contact me if you want to know how to start with MIPS. The, the place you start is call or email me. Thank you very much. So, so again, um, just want to remind everybody, you saw the examples of the Prince George's County based um, companies and you saw like a lot of University of Maryland College Park and, and the campus affiliations. But what you have to understand is you as an individual business owner anywhere in Maryland, but especially here in Prince George's County, if you are an innovator or an entrepreneur of any kind, really, you can look to partner with a university researcher to help you commercialize your product or service offering. So there are lots of ways to partner and you can partner with somebody at different campuses, right? So it, so you're just seeing who, who the affiliation were locally, right? The local companies and the local affiliation. So yeah. just so you know, like Agility is located in College Park, but then also did a, a MIPS grant with a College Park professor, correct? That's correct, yes. And that's, you, you bring up a good point, Alicia, is, is the key is we will search statewide for you. We will help you. It's all about where's that right professor. I've had a northern Baltimore County company work with a University of Maryland Eastern Shore professor because she was the best connection for them that, that knew their technology they needed. It was uh, in fiber science, for example, right? 
We've had uh, you, you know companies that are that are from Southern Maryland be with uh, work with Frostburg. It, it, so it doesn't matter. But we usually start with a geography, uh, the geographical closest one first. But the key is they're all available to you. Any any uh, faculty researcher, professor, adjunct, uh, extension agents, anyone recognized by the University System of Maryland can be the principal investigator, can be the faculty expert that you're utilizing. So basically, this is just one other tool. All of us here today are talking about economic development. We're talking about job creation, business retention, business expansion. We're all working collectively in this ecosystem to help our entrepreneurs and innovators and small business owners kind of get to the next step. So I just wanted to thank Ronnie. If, if anybody has questions right now, related to any of the speakers, um, but specifically to Ronnie or again, any of the other speakers, please put something in the chat if you have any questions, or I think you also have the ability to unmute um, yourself and actually verbally ask a question. And, and if we have a super quiet group, we tried to do this this way to be more engaging, to give people an opportunity to see who else was in the room and be able to chat. It looks like um, Mitchell Smith has unmuted. Did you want it to ask a question? Yeah, I wanted to add, basically ask a question dealing with um, the dealing with, I guess, uh, one of the earlier speakers in terms of manufacturing and processes, wow. as well as the gentleman who just spoke in terms of that. We are, um, well, mostly me, I've done a lot of research. We're doing, because uh, we're doing PPE, doing face masks, and we've developed most of the, in terms of the actual mask and stuff like that, but we are develop, working on developing other masks. But, we, uh, but we're also looking, but we, again, we're looking for the process, you know, I guess the process of setting it up and things of that nature. We've done a lot of the uh, work to uh, find, uh, material and equipment, but it still all has to work together so that we can get the get the numbers right in terms of production and things of that nature. So, you know, the first, I think one of the first people we're dealing with was, uh, man, was they deal with manufacturing. And then of course, the last one was dealing with more dealing with the technology or, or, or pairing you with the right teacher um, professor for the technology and him is more about them for us as materials for, for our new face mask and in terms of the, one of the first uh, people is dealing with the manufacturing and how can we maybe they help us with the manufacturing and things of that nature. So Mitchell why don't you put yourself back on mute and then um, so obviously uh, Michael and you may want to have an offline conversation, I guess, about this a little bit. I think probably um, that may be one of the best things um, to do. And again, most of the individuals here, not necessarily everybody, but intellectual property around your product is an important element um, to what you're doing, um, which is something that you should also be looking to protect if you do have intellectual property. Mike, I don't know if you want to just give a quick response uh, and, and suggestion, and then we'll, we'll let Ronnie say a word too. Okay, I think I can have an offline conversation, but the, the challenge that you just shared and presented um, is not uncommon, especially right now with, with COVID. Um, the response in Maryland of manufacturers and entrepreneurs that have been willing to step up and begin producing PPE has been um, pretty awesome. Assistance and guidance, and obviously, depending on what types of masks you're looking for, of, of requirements from the FDA or things like getting your NIOSH certification around that, we can, we can certainly help you with that. And lastly, I would encourage you to, to check out the Maryland Manufacturing Network.com, um, which is a platform that the MEP put together with the Department of Commerce to collect capabilities from manufacturers and suppliers who are producing PPE to connect them to the management buyers who are the ones that are making the Mike, you're, you're kind of breaking up. So I think basically we will, could you just put the link that you mentioned or the site that Mitchell should look at 
in the chat for everybody. If, and then let's connect you guys uh, offline because I think we were losing you a little bit there. Sorry. Any other um, questions via chat or otherwise that you wanna throw out there? Hi, I have a question. Okay. So my name is Andre Johnson. The question is towards the gentleman that I was speaking with respect to manufacturing. And I, it was just, it's a general question. Uh, what's your experience with respect to toy manufacturers in this region? Do you have a lot of them? Are they successful? Has it been, what's your experience with that, if any? Mike, Mike, you're 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 breaking up again for some unknown reason. So I'm not sure what's going on, but we've lost your sound. Yeah, like toy manufacturers. Um, yeah, like toy so, planes, toy toy cars, things of that nature. So, so again, if we can't get his um sound back, Andre, we may just need to coordinate an individual dialogue with with Mike. Sure. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear hear me now, Alicia? Yes. So, um, there I, I will say toy manufacturers is a segment where there aren't many in the state of Maryland. Um, there are a few sprinkled around, but it's, it's not a, it, it's not a industry where there's a high concentration of toy manufacturers. Okay. Thanks. So I just wanted to, for the good of everybody here, I wanted to just note that um, if you're interested in, in understanding what other global entrepreneurship week programs are going on, please visit um, pgcedc.com um, and take a look at our calendar of events web page. Um, from there, you'll see other upcoming programs that we're going to have um, throughout this week. And so again, all of our small business uh, resource partners have really stepped up to the plate here in Prince George's County and we'll be hosting a number of sessions throughout the week. So please take a look at PGC EDC. Whoops, I just wrote it wrong in the chat, pgcedc.com and, and go to the events page. Um, again, so we have a minute or two before we end. And so before we end, what I wanted to ask is if everybody who was a presenter could go around the room real quick and we'll go in the order in which you went. Steve, if you have one final bit of advice to, to, to share with our local entrepreneurs, we'd appreciate that. And then we'll just go through in the order. So it's gonna be Steve, Mike, Rod, Claire, Michael, and Ronnie. So Steve, starting with you, anything, any last bit of information or advice? Yeah, so I think uh, this has been a great program. Thank you for putting it together. And I think what it illustrated is there are so many resources uh, available, right? And I think we've probably only hit the tip of the iceberg with what we've presented here. Right. So my, my advice would be get out, talk to people and find out what else is out there, right? It's, it's all about who you know you know, with getting a job and other things, but as an entrepreneur, it's all about who you know to tap into the resources, whether those be formal programs or even people as resources, uh, because you, you, need, you need the connections and, and build your network. So that's my suggestion. Mike Kelleher, any last bit of advice? I think uh, Steve just had some, some great advice. The resources in the state are fantastic. And I would encourage everyone to look at those resources and lean on those resources and leverage them. Um, and obviously from a manufacturing standpoint, we wanna keep more of this, this knowledge, more of this IP here in the state. Um, we have so many brilliant people and, and great ideas and too often we look elsewhere to have it manufactured when we've got those capabilities and, and capacity here. So lean on the resources, reach out and, and leverage the network that is here in, in Prince George's County and statewide. Thank you, Mike. Rod, anything from you for the good of the order? Yeah, uh, the two guys in front of me kind of said it, but I'll just drill a little bit deeper. You've got a network, 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 but do it on LinkedIn. I find it to be an incredible tool. Um, in just the time we've been here, I've reached out to some of the other speakers, for example, and have set up uh, opportunities for us to have a chat. Um, if you don't have something like Calendly or a, a mechanism to be able to 
give folks an opportunity to click on a link and up pops your schedule and they can immediately set something on your calendar. Um, it works a lot more beautifully than going back and forth. Well, how does Monday look for you? Horrible. How does Tuesday look for you? Horrible. Um, that kind of stuff. So network, use LinkedIn and uh, use something where people can tap in off of a simple link and just get onto your calendar. Good suggestion. Claire, any bit of advice from you? Yeah, thanks. I agree with everyone that said talked before. LinkedIn is really critical. I think this, um, Alicia, you did a fantastic job coordinating and organizing all these people. I think it underscores the fact that we all are trying to support early stage entrepreneurs and we could all do a better job of coordinating with each other um, and, you know, working with each other. But for sure, you know, networking is the most important thing and having your really clear elevator pitch and pitch deck ready so that we can get you to the right resources at the right time. But I just want to underscore like please email us and contact us, LinkedIn us, um, it's time. And during COVID, people are you know, often more willing to take a quick call. Um, so you know, now's the time to, to get in and try to figure out what resources are available to your company. Thanks. And thanks to Alicia and all of the Prince George's County folks for making this happen. Absolutely, thank you for being a part of it. Michael, any, any last tip from you? Uh, so much good advice already given. Um, my, my best advice to entrepreneurs just starting out is um, know where you are and know where you want to go uh, and have a plan for getting there. Um, so whether that's raising capital, looking for resources, trying to find grant funding, um, really having a, a plan and approaching it methodically as you would like a product build out. Um, that's my best advice. The, the hardest thing about raising capital is it, it often feels like you're just sort of uh, chasing uh, a dragon and you know, you're not really sure w which way to turn or, or who to talk to. And so the more you can sort of formalize it, um, again, that comes from advice from mentors, advisors, um, folks in the community. Um, you know, that that really is my, my, my best advice to sort of short circuiting the process and making your life easier, which we could all use. Absolutely. And Ronnie Gist, one, any, any last bit of advice from you? Well, I'm sitting here thinking, what am I going to add after all these? <laughs> the thing I thought of is, believe it or not, these, the, all of us presenters here presented our different programs today. There is, there are more. The state of right. Maryland has even more. So Google your heart out or contact us because a lot of us know, all, all of us know at least about some of the other programs, if not in detail. We usually know some of the folks working with those programs. Um, one that comes to mind is the Maryland Department of Commerce has many different programs, right, uh, for entrepreneurs in the state. So. Um, keep searching and and the networking is huge i know it's tougher these days but we're all becoming zoom experts uh and and that, that's the key thing is that maryland has so much to offer you to help you along the way thank you and thank you everybody yes absolutely i would just say just remember i'm alicia moran your your small business manager here in prince george's county um, we have a whole team of people within our economic development agency and there are economic development uh centers in each county. So if you don't know your county economic development people, I'd encourage you to reach out. Just a reminder that we are a business incubator, Innovation Station business incubator. Um, so we have a lot of resources available through our business incubator and through the other business incubators in the county here. Um, and again, we are here to help you. So if we are not the right place to be, we're going to connect you to others. And as I showed on the resource chart, much earlier in the program today, we work with SCORE. We work with the Small Business Development Center. If you are looking to, we work with the Women's Business Center. So whether you need a business plan or whether you need to map out your financials or whether you're ready to actually go about getting investment or looking to find out what other resources there are to help you understand what your market opportunity is, there is a host of, uh, there are a host of resources here available to you both in the county and also statewide. And to that point, stay tuned. We're gonna have additional sessions again with Innovation Station and our Chat and Chew programs where we'll bring in some other experts and do more in-depth and more detailed programs about additional resources available to you. Please know that the library is another great resource. And on Thursday, we're beginning, going to be doing a session um, with the local library to talk about the resources there. And we're having a wrap up session at the end of this week um, related to Global Entrepreneurship Week and so that people take away something and, and take action steps. 
So if people want to write in the chat, please um, note something that you've learned in the chat to share with others. I believe we have the opportunity to leave this open, the Zoom open for a little longer if um, people would like to, to chat in the chat. Um, so otherwise, um, we'll just say farewell. Thank you all very much for being a part of our Global Entrepreneurship Week signature project. I again wanna thank our team at Prince George's County Economic Development Corporation for helping make sure this all went smoothly. And I wanna thank all the speakers for being a resource and being an advocate for entrepreneurs and innovators and small business owners, because we know every job created is a job that is had here in our state. So thank you very much.